Hi, it's Tim and Brandon, and we are here with 10 tips to keep you healthy. It's Labor Day weekend, and hope everybody's going to have a good weekend. Uh, as chiropractors, we know that we do labor. Maybe our patients don't always recognize that. I think back to a time I'd been in practice for seven years, and I had not taken more than a long weekend. And I told a patient I wasn't going to be there the next Monday because I was taking off the following week to go on vacation. And she was an older lady and she said, you know, that's all right, honey, you deserve a break because I know you don't work work, but you still need to take some time off. Well, you and I know that we work work, that chiropractic is demanding. It's just not you and I that know that. Journal of Chiropractic Manual Therapy's excellent journal uh, has a study in March that was published by Lamprecht that said that lifetime prevalence of an injury in a chiropractor, 69%. And most of those are the upper extremity. Some of those are the lower extremity, but that's consistent with a lot of data that we see from other fields that when we look at, look at work comp injuries, the number one uh, chunk of injuries happens to healthcare professionals as far as pure numbers. As far as the percentages of those, we drop to three or four just because we don't make that, that much of a, uh, we, we don't get injured quite as often as some of the real heavy manual labors, but we have a lot of healthcare professionals and you and I are in that category that gets injured. So the most common was the upper extremity um, and the second most common was the lower back. In your 40 years of practice, uh, what did you and your... <laughs> So let's talk about the upper extremity first, and you know, a lot of these ideas are you know, stolen essentially from MPI. MPI does a phenomenal job of teaching you how to manipulate, not necessarily how to manipulate, but also when to manipulate, when to stabilize, and then the tips, you know, the, the small nuances, the care that often we forget about when we're in practice that unfortunately can actually turn into repetitive stress once you start to get busier in practice. Uh, my hands, uh, number one, uh, have had a little soreness uh, here and there uh, over the years due to laziness. And it's uh, towards the end of the day, you might have a, a patient where you may not adjust the table properly or you may start to manipulate a little faster. Um, and those are things that can really add up over time. So the first thing as far as hand and, and wrist is definitely line of drive. Can I have you lay on your back for me? And then can you come closer? Um, so power is one of the biggest things, so speed and acceleration as far as manipulation. Um, however, one of the biggest things that I see when working with students and having interns in here is that they'll be all worried about their palpation, which obviously we need to worry about with motion and palpation, but once they find that spot, they get that gleam in their eye, and they're right there, and then they make that manipulation uh, or that thrust. However, this is pretty crappy biomechanics right here. If I need to make the force going that way, I don't want my shoulder and elbow over here. So instead, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move my entire body Body, keeping my elbow in, going through my wrist, through my hand is all one straight line. And when I can do that, I can actually use a. Well, I'm good. Yeah. I'll tell you what, that, that popped right there and I didn't even do anything. That's the hallmark of a true chiropractor, right? You <laughs> scare it out of them. Uh, but no, uh, the force is going right through that one line of drive, uh, whatever that restriction you would find in lateral flexion, rotation, uh, flexion, or, uh, or extension. So, right here uh, is much easier because now I can use my entire upper extremity. I can keep a nice stiff core as I do that, uh, as compared to out here. Now, the other thing is how, actually how I've injured my. Uh, uh, my thumb in the past, can you go on your side for me, is inside posture. There's two things that I really focus on with side posture. Uh, one it is not so uh, much taught uh, in most schools, is actually not this hand, it's this hand. Uh, can you come all the way over here? So when you grab the patient's hand and you have them rolled out, I had this hand, and if you look at my thumbs, I've got a little bit of a double joint there. I'm just I'm a little I was built special, is what my mom always called me. Um, I used to be like this. Uh, the problem is that when you're rolling somebody uh, and they move this hand, it's really gonna jar at that, that thumb. So now what you can do is, is two ways. One, you can have your forearm here, uh, and that's, that's just perfectly fine because that even gets you closer to your patient. Um, but for some reason, that doesn't feel as comfortable to me. I just have my hand here with my thumb on the outside. So not grabbing them, actually having your thumb here, and it keeps it nice and comfortable on the patient. Now, can you come to this side, would you mind? Uh, the second part of this is going to be this hand, uh, the hand that you adjust. And, and I'm not much of a, a technique guru. I, however you get the job done, you can get the job done. Um, but unfortunately, when you're doing side posture, 
you need, especially if your elbow's out here, that's a lot of pressure uh, and extension on your wrist. Uh, so two things uh, that, that I do is one, don't have your elbow out here. Keep your, your elbow in here. And when you have a table that's low enough, you can stay nice and low. But when I get towards the end of the day, or if I've got a sore, um, sore wrist at the end of the day, um, I come across here and I actually have my forearm here uh, right on the SI joint. So when I come here, I can actually adjust through the forearm and drop here and give me the same effect as uh, using my hand. Go ahead and sit up for me. So those are probably the biggest tips that I have when it comes to saving, uh, one, my wrist, but also uh, elbow and shoulder when I'm uh, doing cervical manipulation and also lumbar spine manipulation. So one other thing to think about uh, early in practice, I was working out, uh, I had a massage therapist who was a patient, and I was working out his lower back, I was digging my thumbs into the lumbar rectors, and, and he asked me, you know, do you do that all day long? And I said, yes, and he said, uh, how long do you intend to practice? And, and I said, well, a long time. He said, well, you probably want to cut that in half if you keep using your thumbs that way. So this was a massage therapist and teaching me that I needed to find alternate means. One good way that I can do that in the lumbar erectors, those tough, durable muscles or a quadratus lumborum, is now we'll just get our knuckles in there. So the knuckles of the index finger and the middle finger and running up that patient's back. It just dissipates the force so that I'm not using my thumbs all day long because there are so many muscles that we have to use our thumbs. If you don't have to use your thumbs on a quadricep or on a hamstring, don't use your thumbs. That's one of the more common joints that chiropractors experience osteoarthritis and one that we really want to protect. The other thing is that if you don't have to use any body part, that's even better. So if you can take a factor tool or an instrument assisted tool, that's going to be a whole lot, number one, more efficient, but it's also going to protect us. One other thing that I see issues with is that when we take patients and put them into an A to P mobilization, we manipulate their thoracic spine, that's a lot of force on our hands and when we do that time after time throughout the day, those joints getting compressed in a closed pack position don't appreciate that. So sometimes something like a tepper wedge or whatever, whatever variety you'd like that you can use just to preserve your hands and yes, it may not make a huge difference for one time or one day but in a lifetime, it's gonna make a major difference as to how much trauma those joints have had to endure and how they hold up for the 40 or 50 years that you wanna practice. I think that's a great point. I don't use one of those wedges. Um, uh, however, one thing that I found interesting is that people always got softer tables uh, because they thought it'd be easier on their hand, and I think actually the exact opposite. That if I have a soft table, I think if you look, you know, this has a, a little bit of give, obviously. Um, however, I don't have a fist. Um, so when I manipulate, it's just uh, more of a loosely packed hand uh, instead of creating a fist because it is a little bit harder. So having a softer table might actually cause a little bit of a problem uh, if you are doing a lot of A to P manipulation. Uh, the last part about the upper extremity is probably the shoulder. Now we went over a couple things there, you know, using the forearm and having a good line of drive, but that's probably the biggest part of the shoulder is having that shoulder or elbow, I should say, adducted. As soon as your elbow gets further out, your rate of injury exponentially increases. The shoulder is less and less stable as you move it out. So whatever it is you're doing, make sure you're keeping your elbow in uh, to preserve that because obviously we need that. Uh, one of the biggest the things that I see, especially with teaching classes, is nobody thinks they have a shoulder problem, especially as a chiropractor, uh, which we all uh, mostly do. And one of the number one uh, tender spots that we see is the subscapularis. Because the subscapularis, as we know, has that great mechanical advantage for the rotator cuff, it's also the one thing holding your glenohumeral joint from flying through the back wall when you're doing a side posture manipulation. So keep that shoulder in, keep it nice and stable, use your lats to help stabilize your shoulder, and not just one rotator cuff muscle. I'm really glad that you didn't ask to work the subscapularis on camera because I'd hate to cry. <laughs> Outside of that, when it comes to tables, one thing that we want to make sure is that our table has the right height. That I think if we have a single static height table, it might work for some things, but you're going to develop an overuse injury. That when we get a patient into a side posture position, even if they're a small patient or especially a little larger patient, when that table can get low, we can get into a much better mechanical position. And when we're going to adjust the cervical spine, yeah, we can do that from a chair, but I think you lose a lot of your athletic ability once you take your core out of it by sitting on a chair on a swiveling stool. So make sure that you have a, a table that goes high enough. And Dr. Steele's table is different from the other five or six in our office. It actually goes a little higher. Yeah, and I had the table that you normally use, um, and uh, that table would go up to about maybe here. Yeah. 
Um, so I spent all day long like this, you know, when I was working on patients. And uh, but after about a year or two, I started to develop back pain. Now I found a table that comes up even higher. And now when patients are even mean to me, I can just push them <laughs> off. Uh, but no, having that difference in, you know, six inches uh, makes a big difference. Uh, the same as far as going down. Uh, so now this table can actually drop further than the uh, the other table. I don't know what brand that is, but it just wasn't a good table for me. This one could drop a lot lower. I can get over the patient when I'm uh, manipulating the uh, thoracic and the lumbar spine. So when you uh, when you get a new table, you've had lots of input from your patients about how narrow your table is, right? <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that today. That oh, you want me to roll over on this narrow little table, especially if you don't have a high low table. And yes, that's challenging for the patient, but the reason that we need to keep narrow tables is because the wider this table becomes, the further we have to stand from the center of the patient. So now we put our arms into vulnerable positions. So just because your patients want a wide table doesn't mean that you should want a wide table as well. So the number one uh, reason that, that patients have, or that chiropractors develop problems, is by doing things in a side posture mobilization and not doing things properly. So the third part that we often injure is the lower back. The height of the table will make a difference in the lower back, our positioning over the patient, and how we're going to drop with that patient. That one of the things we wanna make sure that we're doing is number one, bracing our core. That whether we're a baseball player getting ready to hit a baseball or a chiropractor getting ready to adjust a lumbar spine, we wanna make sure that our core is stable. That's the canister. The canister holds a spring, and think of a spring that's almost broken. If it were almost broken and we put it in a can that was sealed, it would take a lot of force to get to that the, the spring and cause damage. But if we put that in a canister that had a leak, you pop open the soda or beer can, now we can put force on that and get to the spring, damage the spring. Well, here's the canister, my spine is the spring instead. So if we're able to now pressurize that canister before we apply forces, it's much better. So before we drop onto that large patient or small patient, we wanna make sure that we're stabilizing, and that doesn't mean hollowing of sucking our belly in. We have guy wires that stabilize our spine, kind of like a fishing pole. If I push down on it, it'd be wobbly, but if I put guy wires on that, those guy wires provide stability. The further out those guy wires are set, the more stability we have. Think of a power lifter. They're genetically geared to be able to lift huge weights, and they're not narrow and skinny, they're wide like a barrel. Their, their guy wires are out. So when we stabilize our core, we should not be sucking in, we should be pushing out. And the way that we can do that and train our patients to is just resist someone pushing in. So if I grab the patient, I push in on their ribs and say, resist me. That's abdominal bracing. So before I deliver a thrust to the patient, whether it be a simple cervical manipulation or a side posture, I'm gonna make sure that I'm bracing my core in that process. So let's go ahead and see that. Uh, go on your side, face this way. Um, I'm glad his mind's already on beer cans, being Labor Day weekend. Um, but uh, so, uh, how this would look, especially in um, in practice, to have uh, the best biomechanically sound manipulation for uh, side posture, in my mind, um, would be to have your hand like this, uh, have a table that's low enough, have a table that's narrow enough, so you're not leaning over the patient. Uh, you've rolled them in, and I use my forearm. And what Dr. Burlesman was talking about is this leg. So whenever I go to manipulate, if I was just here and just try to twist using my upper extremity, I'm really gonna be using all my upper extremity. I need to use my body weight. So when I come to here, if I can just drop down on the patient, and a lot of times, um, I'm gonna actually just drop completely on the patient. I'm taking my body weight, I'm taking it through my forearm, and I'm going right through that joint. So here, I let the knee drop, and here, and it's usually pretty easy on the patient, um, and then also on us. It doesn't overuse any specific joint. I think we can do that, and you can do it over and over again, you know, especially throughout the day. You're not gonna have any kind of repetitive stress injuries, and you're putting things in the best possible position uh, to, to do your job. Yeah. And our last tips are, just like you tell your patient, we're standing on usually hard floors. A lot of us practice on floors that are concrete underneath a thin piece of carpet, so make sure you're wearing shoes that have good arch supports. Maybe something that has a little style would help too, but shoes that <laughs> have good arch supports, uh, or even a shock absorbent mat uh, underneath if you're gonna be standing mm -hmm. in one position for a long period of time and you have issues. And lastly, we talk to our patients all day long about functional deficits, that if they have a forward head, forward shoulder posture, they're going to develop neck problems. If they have scapular dyskinesis, they're going to develop rotator cuff problems. If they have core instability or hyperpronation or hip abductor weakness, we need to look for those things in ourselves because we're training 
forward, head forward, shoulder postures. We're training lower cross syndromes. And if we do that day after day, eventually something in that system is gonna fail. So take a look at yourself and say, what can I do? There's probably not a chiropractor in the world who couldn't benefit by doing some stretching for their pecs and traps and strengthening of these scapular stabilizers. That's what's gonna protect our upper extremity. Have a good Labor Day. One more thing. Oh. If you have not checked out the blog uh, recently, you're gonna to wanna to check out this Sunday's oh, blog. Yeah. Excellent information from Dr. James Demetrius. He has made a connection that shows that antibiotics double the risk of stroke. So the cervical arterial dissection, that risk doubles if someone has taken a fluoroquinolone antibiotic. He's detailed it all in our blog. This is really breaking news. I think it would be available now if you would go to the Cairo website. I think it's probably previewed. And if you're not getting our blog, make sure you sign up for that. Just go to CairoUp.com, sign up for the blog. You'll get it in your inbox box on a weekly basis. And that's the cool part about the new version too. If you see on the top left, it'll say notifications. Anytime we get a new research article, especially that important, uh, but we create a new infographic, we put in a new exercise, you're gonna see that on that notification. So you're gonna see all the changes being made and all the research. And we were joking before this Facebook uh, Live uh, that this is an old paper. It's from March of this year. Right. <laughs>